Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Welcome My name is Ryan Lee, Golden here once State again, and I hope you're once again podcast. staying safe amongst your the pandemic. We have whole got a football. lot of things Are to get into, to get including some of the latest hirings the and firings amongst the NCAA Black us Monday, as, as often called. We're also going to refer to some of the to draft eligible players and who has and who has not declared for the draft. And we finally, we will be getting the into 10, SEC, some scandal, 12, some investigation, 12, how this affects a top SEC program and what this could potentially do, not just in the SEC, but also amongst the entire NCAA. And finally, a changing of the guard in the Pac-12, how that is going to shake everything up. I hope you are as excited as I am. I most certainly am. The divisional round has just passed in the NFL. The conference championships are coming on Sunday. Hockey is back. Basketball is back. I am in a very excited sports mood, and I am most certainly ready to talk about some more. But let's get right into it. Every single time a season ends, and this is transferable across all sports, there is this thing that happens no matter what level doesn't matter what sport it's going to happen it is often referred to as black monday now if you're not familiar with black monday is what it is simply put is the day after a season ends so in the nfl they start on a sunday it just typically happens on a monday in the NBA and the NHL, it kind of depends which day the season falls on. But pretty much what it is, is that it's the day where all the coaches and coordinators and general managers and whomever else get fired because of consistent, underwhelming performance. Now, for example, this year in the NFL, there were a grand total of seven available coaching positions that came on Black Friday. You had Doug Peterson getting let go from the Philadelphia Eagles. You had Raheem Morris getting let go from the Atlanta Falcons. You had Matt Patricia getting let go from the Lions midway through the year. That position is still open. You had Anthony Lynn getting let go of the LA Chargers. You even had the New York Jets got rid of Adam Gase. They left that one open. Doug Marone was finally let go from the Jacksonville Jaguars. And then you had Bill O'Brien let go in the middle of the year from the Houston Texans. That job is still open. You get this a lot in sports where you just need to figure out who the next guy is. A lot of times with head coaches, you either get massive hits You get those guys who are going to be around for a very long time. They're going to be the primary leaders of your team for probably years, if not decades to come. And you also get guys who they are pretty good for a couple of years. Nothing super terrible, but they might just be average or above average. You know, a couple of playoff appearances here and there. Or maybe they go back and forth between a winning season and close to 500 and a playoff berth here and just missing out the next year or whatever. They're good, but not great. And then you also get the guys who are consistent underwhelmers. They perform under par consistently no matter how long they've been there. And then you just get the guys who are just flat out bad. Every single time they're there, from the moment they're hired to the moment they're fired, they are completely as underwhelming as possible. They might even have lowered the bar for not only the league, but actually for themselves as well. And this actually brings up my point because with all of the stuff going on in the NCAA in terms of the head coaching hires and the fires... I actually think that's a little more difficult because of the fact that in the college game, not only there's so many coaches and 
so many places to go, but also because the game is a lot different than what it actually is. In the NFL, however, you mostly stick within the realm of NFL coaches. The only question is whether or not you go ahead and maybe change things up in the college ranks because they want to try something new. Matt Rule was that last year. Cliff Kingsbury was that a couple of years ago. They weren't there because they necessarily wanted to go to the college level. It's mostly because they wanted to try something new with the culture that they were trying to build. And college coaches are a little bit different in that way because most of the time you can either get those guys in the NFL to come down or stay within the NCAA. Because not every college offense translates to the NFL. But almost every NFL offense can translate into NCAA. And same with the defense. Not every NCAA defense translates in the, in the NFL. But almost any NFL defense can translate in the NCAA. And why is this exactly? It simply just comes down to a higher amount of skill and football IQ that can be retained from one level to the other. You can outsmart someone and still succeed. You can't necessarily win a chess match if you are maybe less knowledgeable about the game of chess or any mental game for that aspect. And that is why with some of the latest hirings and firings of coaches amongst the coaching carousel, I was actually pretty surprised about some of the different changes made. Some of the positions have actually been retained. A lot of them have been changed for whatever reason. Everyone knows about how uh, Will Muskamp got fired very early in the year for U of SC. There's also some openings over at Vanderbilt where Derek Mason was fired towards the end of the year. You also had Auburn have an opening. Tom Herman was probably the most notable firing of the bunch. And Jeremy Pruitt, who also got fired. But I want to focus mostly a little bit on this Texas job with Steve Sarkeesian and Tom Herman. Because... Tom Herman, he had some tenure with the Texas Longhorns. He's a relatively young coach, by the way, a offensive guy. He spent three years with Texas, only 45 years old, so he's got a lot of time left to be played. However, one of the big things is that he really had some up and down years at Texas. And I don't think it necessarily had to do with the fact that Texas was bad. I think it more or less has to do with the fact that Texas was underwhelming for Arlar Shankovic. Yes, they won the Alamo Bowl two years in a row. Every single year that he has been there, it has been top three, top four in the Big 12. He has won a bowl game, you know, the Texas Bowl, the Sugar Bowl, the Alamo Bowl twice. More or less ending in the top 25 almost every single year he was at Texas. And then you had his time at Houston where he was putting up some really great teams together. You know, winning the Peach Bowl, leading the entirety of the AAC, whatever it may be, a 13-1 record in his first year as a college head coach. Going 22-4 and for Herman was really one of the reasons why he was such a force to be reckoned with in him deciding to transition into a bigger school. You know, he said, University of Houston is not big enough. So, of course, I'm going to go one of the biggest programs out there, UT, Texas, the Longhorns, Vince Young. You some of those very high-end quarterbacks. You had Sam Ellinger at the helm, which means he was going to uh, really give you a legit shot. You know, Colt McCoy had a very great season there. So you kind of have a little bit of historical background with Texas. And he didn't do bad at Texas. He was 32-18 and in his entire time there, which 
isn't bad, to be fair. You know, he went 32 wins and a grand total of a 64% win percentage. But I think why Tom Herman ultimately got fired didn't have to do with the fact that he was bad as a coach, per se, but mostly because he was underwhelming to what Texas wanted. And when you're a historical program of any kind, the expectations on you are that much higher. That's why when Steve Sarkeesian ultimately decided to take this job at Texas, despite having previous head coaching record, the belief was is that Sarkeesian was supposed to stay in Alabama and take over when Nick Saban retires because he has that pedigree and because an outside coaching hire would make the job so much more difficult for whomever took over that program. You essentially not only had to change a team, but you essentially had to not only create your own legacy, but build off the one you just left behind. That's why for the past several years, there has been a huge dip with Michigan State essentially. Nothing against the Michigan State football team. It just has to do with the fact that ever since Mark D'Antonio decided to step away from the sidelines and take a more of, you know, subtle right. He decided to retire after 14 seasons with the Spartans and kind of just, you know, call it a career, at least with coaching. He has been pretty outstanding. He was 114 and 57 with Michigan State in 12 years worth of coaching. From 2007 all the way to 2015, he got them four Big Ten championships and he got them a flurry of bowl wins, including the Rose Bowl, including the Cotton Bowl, including, you know, some of these larger named bowl games where he did ultimately have teams in some of the top echelon of sports. That year where Michigan State won the Rose Bowl, they finished number three in 2014. They were number five and number six in 2015. But ever since he has retired, Michigan State, at least to me, never really looked the same. And, you know, nothing against Mel Tucker, He hasn't been a bad coach thus far, per se. It's just that he was a little underwhelming this year, 2-5 and as a head coach. Yes, you can claim, you know, it's a first-time head coach and that in a couple of years, he'll have slowly developed and built a culture. However, I never understood necessarily why hire Mel Tucker When he has such little experience. I mean, yes, I get that he did have a little bit of NFL experience. I do understand that he did have a stint as an interim head coach for the Jacksonville Jaguars in his past. Sure, he did have a stint at Colorado. Sure. But when he was in Colorado, he was 5-7. and When he was with Jacksonville, he went 2-3 and as an interim coach. And then with Michigan State, he went 2-5. and five. So it is just as important not only who is getting left behind, but who is getting filled into that role. Especially when you consider, you know, Steve Sarkeesian, he does have some former coaching pedigree. He has spent time over with Washington. He has spent some time over at USC. He has an overall coaching record, which isn't terrible, of... 46 and 35, which only nets him about a 57% win percentage. So there's still a lot to be known about Steve Sarkeesian, except the difference between what Sarkeesian has done then versus what he can do now is the difference that he spent between the time of him beginning essentially losing the USC head coaching job. He was an offensive assistant in Alabama, interim offensive coordinator, 
then went to the Atlanta Falcons, became the offensive coordinator there, and then became the Alabama offensive coordinator and QB coach. He has a lot of offensive experience, and especially when you have Texas, who is most likely going to be starting a brand new quarterback, it's probably a best idea to start off fresh with just kind of that perfect timing, especially with Sam Ellinger declaring for the draft. And it's kind of scary how good Nick Saban's coaching tree is, kind of going off of that tangent. Because he didn't start his career off very well. He, you know, was very okay, you know, 92, starting off at Toledo, had a couple of 500 seasons. Then Michigan State all of a sudden kind of shoots up to number nine in the AP poll at a 92 record, goes to LSU, wins some national championships, gets a national championship a couple of times, and then um, you get into, you know, 48 and 16 over LSU, number one teams, some top 10 teams, and then he goes to Alabama where he literally changes the entire game. Had one really rough season at 2-6 and six, and then turns it around literally at 2-12 and 12, and has been double-digit wins ever since then. Yes, you can argue that Nick Saban is the greatest college head coach of all time and that his tree is kind of insane. But it kind of shows what type of struggle you need to go through in order to become one of the most successful head coaches of all time. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes a lot of failure, especially when it doesn't just teach you how to handle rejection, but it even teaches you how to build, how to create something out of nothing. You know, Mark D'Antonio, the guy I just talked about, the Michigan State head coach, he actually came from the Saban coaching tree. So did some other very notable names. Josh McDaniels, offensive coordinator of the New England Patriots. Jimbo Fisher, head coach to the Texas San Diego Maggies. Jason Garrett, longtime Dallas Cowboys head coach. Pat Shermer, he was a longtime offensive coordinator, still is. Dan Quinn, head coach of the Atlanta Falcons for the last several years. Adam Gase, head coach of the Miami Dolphins and Jets for a little bit. Kirby Smart, current head coach of the Georgia Bulldogs. Lane Kiffin, current coach of Ole Miss. Jeremy Pruitt, recently let go but was a head coach for a little bit in Tennessee. And then you also get some of these other guys like Mel Tucker, who's currently in Michigan State. Freddie Kitchens, who spent a stint in the NFL. Joe Judge, currently a head coach in the NFL. Steve Sarkeesian, as I just mentioned. However, the amount of success these guys had... Aside from a few, isn't anything super notable or anything super exciting? It's kind of very similar to the Belichick tree, where a lot of Belichick's assistants don't really go on to be that great of head coaches. But Andy Reid does, and Bill Walsh does, and some of the greatest head coaches have some of the greatest coaching trees. I'm not going to get too much into that, but I will say this. The one benefit that you could say Alabama got is that they have a guy who has some head coaching experience in Bill O'Brien. Eight and four, seven and five, both with Penn State, combined fifteen and nine. And then he gets the job with the Houston Texans. Gets them to a couple of wild cards and divisionals within his stint there for seven years. Most recently fired because they started off the season 0-4 and and kind of got a little power hungry with the whole GM thing. It could be a role for O'Brien he might need. He might need a role where he can just do his job without control. Where he can just focus on running an offense instead of focusing on running an entire organization. Maybe the power got to his head a little bit, which is why he failed most recently with Houston. But we have to wait and see, obviously as a lot of these big-name recruits and big-name players start coming in. That's what I had in terms of the head coaching openings. And when we get back after the break, we're going to be talking about a passing of the torch in the Pac-12. Why some of the most powerful people in the Pac-12 are going to be changing. That's going to be coming up right after this. 
Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Back here in the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you once again by the GSMC Podcast Network. Ryan Lee here once again, and we just finished talking about some of the head coaching openings coming up in the future NCAA football season. But let me get into a bit of a different subject today, and let me just start off by saying: doesn't matter what industry you're in. It doesn't matter what position you're in or how old you are. Money is a responsibility. Whether if it's to pay your bills, whether if it's to get food, whether if it's just something as simple as buying a movie ticket to go out with your friends, or whether if it's just as simple as saving up for that toy you want, or that game you want, or the house you want, whatever it may be. It's a responsibility. And as you get older, that money slowly becomes less about yourself and more about groups of other people. The most powerful people in the world, the wealthiest people in the world, they're not that wealthy because of themselves. They're wealthy because, yes, they built something by themselves, but the reason why they continue to drive revenue every single day is because they have to be responsible with that money towards the efforts of other people. Whether if it's a restaurant for example you have to pay for the food itself you have to pay for people to serve that food and cook that food and you need to make sure that the pace is clean make sure it is looks good make sure that people actually want to be there however when it comes to some of these larger entities whether it fits let's say like, like tech industry You need to make sure you don't just have a platform that's usable across multiple different forms of technology. You also need to make sure it's an idea that people are actually going to use. You need to make sure it's an idea that people aren't just going to use, but they're going to enjoy and use multiple times over and over again. It can't just be one of those things that people are just going to use one time, but it's got to be one of those things that people are going to continue to revisit every single time. And not only because they revisit multiple times, They even get things to continue expanding and to continue to grow and continue to get better and bigger and whatever it may be. Money is responsibility no matter where it is. And every time you spend it towards something, it's either a spent or it's a investment is a thing that I've been told a lot of times. You either spend money or you invest it for whatever reason it may be. You know, you might buy a suit but maybe that's for some future job interviews and you know you land a job because you look professional and you carry the proper demeanor therefore you get hired and you essentially get that money back that's an investment or for example like you get coffee you get a coffee machine you get some mugs you make the coffee in your house you spent probably a good chunk of money over time but that coffee energizes you to care the rest of your day, to make even more money, etc., etc. And when everything gets invested poorly, you're not simply just investing it at that point. It becomes just spending out of nothing. Whenever people just buy what some might refer to as junk or what some people might just refer to as stuff, that just becomes spending. And it's part of the reason why Larry Scott was under such hot water with the Pac-12. It's because 
he became a spender. He wasn't an investor. He was a spender. He essentially kept all this money and essentially hoarding it, millions of dollars to be fair, and he didn't put it towards the betterment of the Pac-12. Instead, what he did is he focused it on the betterment of himself. And yes, he might have seen it as an investment on himself, whether if it is, you know, buying a bigger suite for tournaments or whether if it's going a little cheaper on TV deals and stuff like that. However, Scott failed to realize that that's not how successful conferences are going to work. Some of the other biggest conferences across of all sports, including the SEC, the Big Ten, or even if you go into some things like the NFL, the NHL, so on and so forth, you really have to think about not only what's at stake, but how can you maximize the return on investment, as in how much are you spending to get back. And the fact that they even wouldn't let him into the room when negotiating a TV deal is already red flag number one. The fact that the Pac-12 executives essentially voted him out of the group is kind of a big red flag. And the fact that they refused to even let him into the room when discussing TV deals is another huge red flag. And sure, he was able to do a couple of things. He did choose to add teams like Utah and Colorado And yes, he did have added in their very own TV network for the Pac-12, kind of like how the Big Ten does, kind of like how the SEC does. However, those are very small. But part of the biggest issue of why Larry Scott had such a huge downfall is more or less because of the fact that it did cost more to even have the Pac-12 in the first place, which to be fair... Is nothing wrong with that. Charging more for the rights of the Pac-12. There's nothing wrong with that. But the way they did it was the big issue there. It's the fact that he signed a deal with ESPN and Fox on the TV deals that would expire in three years. Which gave some of the other commissioners, like say like the Big Ten or the SEC or whomever more time and more opportunities to not only renew but to renegotiate. I understand that if you wanted to sign a 12-year TV contract with ESPN and Fox for the reasons of stability, I get that. But you lose the option of renegotiation later. If you ever pay attention to sports professional contracts, whether it's the NFL, NHL, or whatever, you don't see many long-term contracts, maybe even more than the ballpark of, like, let's say, five years. I think the longest contract you think of that's been signed in recent memories is maybe the Patrick Mahomes deal. But aside from that, you maybe see nothing greater than about seven years. But the average contract now is in the ballpark of three to five. And you're also seeing certain players getting a lot of one-year deals. But why do they do this? It's so they get an opportunity to not only get better, but because they understand that if they get better within that time, they can renegotiate later. It's also the fact that the Pac-12 wasn't producing as much as they wanted to. They didn't really have that many teams producing that well when it came to basketball, despite a long history of relatively good basketball teams, you know, Arizona, Arizona State, UCLA, etc., Same with football, your teams like Oregon, your teams like USC, your teams like Arizona and Arizona State, once again, none of them really did anything. And yes, they might be having issues with recruiting because all the top recruits keep wanting to go to teams in the southeastern part of the U.S. Essentially, Larry Scott just kind of initially invested, sure, but it turned into just large amounts of spending, irresponsible spending, stuff that you would see from definitely not a man in his mid-50s running a multi-million, multi-billion dollar industry, especially one as big as college sports, an entire conference, if you will. The Pac-12 Sports Network, 
is, you know, nothing really that big of an issue because I know a lot of other conferences do it as well. But some of the biggest issues that even happened was that there was no availability for it to happen. They never tried to get any sort of deal done, whether if it be with Spectrum or DirecTV or Xfinity, so on and so forth. It was the beginning of the end where, yes, he was very well liked. However, a lot of the decisions he were making were just very off. He was making double the amount of money in his own pocket than most of his peers. Sometimes triple the amount of money. He decided to spend money into a central office that was just extremely expensive. It's the fact that they're not gaining as much, for lack of a better word, pushing power. Or I guess they're not gaining nearly as much leeway into some of these larger TV deals and larger advertising deals. And it all starts with him. Irresponsible spending and irresponsible business practices is why the Pac-12 is looking for a new head. Why they're trying to change up their formula. Why they're trying to do anything else. Because they don't just want the betterment of the Pac-12. They also want to do something that's better for all these individual schools as well. Because with the way that the lack of publicity has been going... The way that the lack of exposure, the way that the lack of notoriety, the inefficient spending, what have you. Also pair that with the lack of successful teams due to inability to recruit well. Due to said lack of exposure and lack of notoriety, etc. And lack of resources, most importantly. The Pac-12 kind of took a giant nosedive over the past couple of years as Larry Scott's tenure came to a close. Was this segment essentially just a giant deep dive of why the Pac-12 is changing commissioners? Yes, it was. But did it kind of give a better idea into why the business side of college sports is also so important? Yes. Because you can make the argument that you should just leave college sports their own independent entities But at the same time, why do you think college sports has become so big the way it is? It's not because the schools are big. It's because of the amount of marketing and the amount of exposure that these teams get. Do you really think Alabama would get as much notoriety as it does if it played on a much smaller network? Or do you think that it would get cluttered as much when the SEC doesn't really have to clutter its airspace with 900 different other games across the country? Or do you think it's a lot easier for those teams like Clemson, like Alabama, like whomever to have those games where they can stand alone, where they can be more popular, where they can gain a higher notoriety, gain more exposure? Because believe it or not, high school athletes, they want fame. They want exposure. They want notoriety. It's just the way that works. It's part of the recruitment process. They want to see how awesome the school is. And when they can't even see on any given Saturday or Friday or whatever day it is how good the school's football team is, why would they want to go? It's why they didn't want to continue having Scott in the first place. And it's why in the next several weeks to months, We are going to have to look out for a potential changing of the guard uh, in the Pac-12. Who's going to lead that ship? Who knows? That's been it for that. And after this, we're going to be going into some scandal, some fiasco coming up right after this. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
<laughs> From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. <laughs> Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Back here on the GSMC podcast once again, Ryan Lee back here. We just talked about the pass of the torch in the Pac 12 as well as some of the openings in the head coaching trees. But I'm going to switch into a bit of a different topic for right now because no matter where we are, whether if it's in sports or entertainment, business, it seems like whenever something happens that is out of line, out of character, any sort of thing happens, whether if it's a scandal, whether if it's a crime, it is a really big deal to anyone who is in it. It's a big deal. And when it comes to things like bringing in brand new players, especially because if you think about it, most of these guys who are coming into the recruiting atmosphere, they're maybe in the ballpark of 17 to maybe 19. If you include the JUCOs, maybe 20 at most for a two-year JUCO or junior college, if you will. And when you have an investigation launched against you, there is more likely than not going to be no way out of it. Because if you have an investigation on you, it's for a logical reason. We've seen this all over sports. You know, Deflate Gate, Spy Gate, Bounty Gate, etc. They're literally called the gates. You have, you know, it's things in politics. You know, you get things like Watergate. You get stuff like impeachment. Those are investigations at the end of the day. You get millions upon millions of criminal investigations. Did this person do the crime? Yes or no? And then... You have what happened in the University of Tennessee with this investigation going on, essentially involving some violations where there have been some violations against the NCAA's recruiting policy, and it all fell under the regime of Jeremy Pruitt, the ex-head coach of the University of Tennessee. And it wasn't even just Pruitt who was the one who got axed in this situation, but even including some assistant coaches, some recruiting staff, one of the directors of player personnel, so on and so forth. And it's even kind of crazy when you include the fact that Philip Fulmer, the athletic director of UT, actually... Retired as well. So you're going to have a bunch of this changing of the guard over in Tennessee. And you kind of have this whole investigation looming. Essentially saying there may have been some violations that Pruitt was aware of. Or that he is the one instigating. And we're not exactly sure. Not just exactly what the investigation is. Or necessarily the severity of the situation. However, we do understand that there have been violations of NCAA rules and NCAA laws. And the reason why these are important is because no matter where we are, rules are there for a reason. And no one is necessarily above those rules. Even presidents, they get impeached because of unlawful enforcement of the law the only issue with the number of 
violations Pruitt had wasn't even the fact that he had violations. It's the fact that they had so many violations. There is no official number on how many in all the research I could find. But it's the fact that they tried to push it under the rug and hide it the best they can. Part of the reason why, at least in modern times, why crimes often don't go as unsolved anymore is because the fact that things get concealed or the ability to conceal things is not as easy anymore. When you have all this technology, all this training, all this knowledge on how things work, those investigations just don't fly anymore. Or the attempt to conceal just doesn't work anymore. I mean, I guess it's not that bad for Pruitt himself. At least, yes, he's going to be out of a coaching job. But he's still going to be owed upward of $12 million. And kind of getting bought out for the rest of the year. He does have some of that. However, there is no official word on exactly what the violations that Pruitt Had It just simply says that the investigation has yet to be completed. They do not know about the transcripts of any of the interviews that Coach Pruitt conducted. And there's even no evidence thus far of any alleged violations or that he was even aware that they occurred. Which I honestly find a little bit fishy. Because if a coach got not only fired, but fired due to the investigation, there would have to be some sort of reasonable cause. It's the reason why a policeman cannot search your car when they pull you over for speeding. Sometimes they pull you over for speeding because you just sped. But sometimes they can do more because they have a probable cause. Maybe they just smell marijuana in your car and in whatever state you're in it might be illegal then they have the right to do that but in this case there's no probable cause on to why Pruitt is getting investigated in the first in the first place it just seems that everything kind of seems alleged however if you are a top college program that generates hundreds of millions of dollars like the NCAA football multi-billion dollar industry and just maybe just University of Tennessee as a whole you don't want that tarnish on your record even though he does have time left before the investigation is over and the fact that everything is getting monitored by NCAA officials we still have to wait and see how everything goes It even went into this latest recruiting class where some of the violations might have occurred with some potential 2021 incoming players, but a lot of them maybe signed with other schools or just didn't sign with Tennessee for whatever reason. And maybe those players are at least aware of what happened, but we don't know yet because there's not enough information. I've been looking all over the place. They do not have enough information for me to make anything conclusive. All I know is that Tennessee finished 3-7. and seven. All I know is that hired a defensive assistant from Auburn. And all I know is that Jeremy Pruitt is no longer head coach of the University of Tennessee. So we'll just have to wait and see as more information comes out and I'll do a follow-up on this later. We got one final segment. It's going to be another really quick segment, just like this one is. It's going to be about draft eligibility and who has declared. That's coming up right after this. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info.
And we're back for the final time here on the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Ryan Lee here for the final time, and we have got a little bit of a heads up, to say the least, as almost everyone tends to know one of the biggest parts of being in the NCAA for football, at least, is just getting to the NFL. It is that pinnacle, top echelon of football, American football, for some of the international people. They might refer to football, they might think soccer in the States. But no, it's the American football. But when you think about the pinnacle of sports and what it takes to be a top athlete in some of the top sports in the world, in the Big Four, actually, it is the Big Four. The NFL, the NHL, the NBA, and the MLB. However, when you start branching out into more sports around the world, you slowly get to see more and more sports leagues kind of branch out internationally. So when you think big-time soccer around the world, you don't think of the MLS, I don't know about you, but for me personally, whenever I saw international or high-level soccer at, let's say, like the team level, not international level, my first thought was never the MLS. I always thought of the MLS as actually like a bottom-tier league. I always thought of La Liga, the EPL, maybe Serie A in, in Italy, and then you get some of these other sports around the world. You might get things like rugby. You get things like... You get swimming with the ISL and the major world championships, the Grand Prix, stuff like that. Every single sports league not only has a top league, but it has to have something to build up to it. So let's say, for example, even though it's not as prevalent now because of the downsizing due to pandemic things, but you had the MLB and you had the minor league baseball. You had the NHL and you had the American Hockey League or some of the leagues internationally, including uh, leagues in Russia, Sweden, Canada, etc. Or the Canadian Juniors. You had the NBA G League. And in the NFL, what you get is the college system. And a large part of what takes on whenever you get entered into these top leagues is You get selected onto a team. The team selects you. You don't choose a team. It's very different from high school, college versus college to the pros. The teams choose you. You don't choose the teams. And the reason why I wanted to emphasize that point is because these guys right here who are going to be going into the draft, some of the guys like Trevor Lawrence, like Justin Fields, like Zach Wilson, like Trey Lance, Kyle Trask, Najee Harris, Jared Patterson, Jalen Wall, Jamar Chase, you know, whoever else you can include in the list. Every single one of these players, they're going to be going through a much different experience than the one they went to four years ago or three years ago. Because back then, they had all the choice in the world, and literally teams are begging to choose them. In this case, it's a bit different because I have gone through the recruiting process myself for swimming, and... When you're going through that process as a 17, 18 year old kid, you have all the power in the world because every school wants you. And essentially, the decision is will you choose them? And essentially, the schools are in their utmost best behavior. You can be in your absolute worst behavior if you like. And sure, some schools just won't offer you. But you could be like the worst human in the world and the school is still going to take you because they want your athletic ability. They can coach you on the rest of the stuff. In the NFL, none of that flies. If you're going to be the worst person on the team, they're just not going to pick you. Because the game flips, which I think is actually kind of messed up in a good way, to say the least. When you have all of these teams and players... You've got things like instead of the teams having to be on their best behavior and the schools having to make everything super pretty and perfect, 
for you to choose them, what happens instead is that the player has to be at their utmost best because the team at the end of the day is choosing them. The choice goes from the players to the entity. In this case, it's the teams. It's one of those things I never really thought about until I started doing this show and started doing this, which is how much control really do college players get? They have so much control over everything. I'm pretty sure out of like every single minor league or I guess pre-pro league, the NCAA has the most control to the players. And it's also the one where the programs themselves have actually the least amount of control. And I don't mean least amount of control in terms of control. I mean least amount of control in terms of freedom and choices. Because they essentially just have to cater to the guys to keep them in. Sure, they can fall in love with it, but literally any day they can just transfer and go to another school. Jalen Hurts, great example of that. He didn't like the fact that he was getting a chance to play because he was getting replaced by Tua. And he literally just said, I'm out of here. I'm taking my services over to Oklahoma. Same with Joe Burrow. He entered the transfer pool. He was originally an Ohio State Buckeye. And then he lost the starting job to Dwayne Haskins. And he's like, nope, I want starting time. I'm going to go over to LSU and have arguably the best college team ever. It's kind of crazy how the way that these leagues have changed and the way the overall athlete mindset has changed in terms of that. It goes from the power to the players to the power of the organizations, the power of the front offices. Because they, at the end of the day, choose everything. And that's what's going to happen here with a lot of these guys. So yeah, Trevor Lawrence did choose Clemson. Justin Fields did choose Ohio State, etc., etc. It's crazy when you think that because they declared for the draft, they're no longer a prize to be sought for. They just become a product of someone else's choosing. So yeah, Jacksonville most likely is going to get Trevor Lawrence. And Trevor Lawrence is more than likely just going to have to live with it. Is he most likely just going to be happy to be in the league? Sure, that can happen. But also, is his future going to be solely based on what the team does? Pretty much. It's a little messed up when you think about it. Kind of a weird take on the NFL draft and draft eligible players. But I kind of thought it was a very important point to make. Especially when you think about the way that these players have been brought up to this point. It's part of the process. It's how things are done. It's how they've been done for years, for generations at this point. The players choose the college, but now the teams choose the players. Because the larger and more powerful and the more impactful the organization, the more effect they have on your life and the more control they have over what goes on. I was keeping my eye on some hockey news earlier today and two of the top players in the NHL, they got traded for one another. Did one of them request a trade? Yes. But did the other players who were part of that trade ask for that trade? No. They were essentially traded against their own will. They probably just had to walk into the GM's office and be like, hey, pack your stuff. You're getting shipped. You got traded. We traded you. We put you somewhere else. It's got to be a little weird knowing how little control they got. But it's just the way it kind of worked in the sports industry if you think about it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's kind of interesting to see how that evolution works. That's been it for today's episode of the GSMC College Football Podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Be sure to rate us five stars, leave a comment, and a like. We really appreciate that so much. Be sure to find us on all of our favorite social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all of the favorite places you look for your podcasts. Don't forget to come back here next week. Don't forget to stay safe. And for all of us here at the GSMC Podcast Network, this has been the GSMC College Football Podcast. My name is Ryan Lee. 
I will see you next week. I hope you have a great rest of your night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From football to basketball, baseball to MMA, and even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.